I, yes, right I gather that uh, there are a couple of seats still here, uh, One. but those of you who who don't have seats are welcome to stand and, and, and listen very patiently. There are a couple of seats here for people who are very brave to and another one over here. But you have to sit next to Rick Katz, <laughs> which is <laughs> indeed a pleasure for some, uh, including me. Uh, I guess there's one there, yes. Good. There are a couple up front here. Anyway, uh, I'm Hugh Patrick uh, from the Columbia Center on Japanese Economy and Business. Um, I welcome you to this uh, special lecture uh, co-sponsored by the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and the Center on Japanese Economy and Business. Uh, following the lecture by Professor Curtis, we'll have a Q&A, and, and he said he'll, he'll take the questions directly. Uh, we'll end about 6.30, and then there will be a reception out there, and this will give you a chance uh, uh, to chat with each other and, uh, and a bit with Professor Curtis, though he has to talk to some media people for about 10 minutes right after this. But we all look forward to, to that, informal as well as particularly to his more formal comments. Um, you know, it's, it's one of my honors as well as pleasures at Columbia to in introduce um, our speaker on special occasions such as this. Uh, uh, Gerald Curtis Burgess, Professor of Political Science. I think he's uh, uh, the most uh, uh, well knowledge knowledgeable and, and acknowledged uh, specialist on Japanese politics um, anywhere in the world outside Japan and perhaps inside Japan as well. Uh, I'm always interested that Japanese particularly like to come and hear what he has to say because he provides a different and in independent perspective. Uh, Jerry uh, spends a fall semester here and typically spends a spring semester in Japan, coming back sometimes in the early center, uh, early summer. Um, he's um, uh, given this lecture now, for, I guess, for seven or eight years, so we've come to think of it both as a special lecture but really as, a, as an annual event. And uh, I find that I end up saying pretty much exactly the same thing every year. Uh, first of all, I say, and I continue to say, it's never boring to listen to Jerry, because uh, what he has to say about uh, Japanese politics. Uh, but uh, I guess the theme is getting a bit repetitive. Uh, uh, as you know, every uh, year for the last, this is the first year, I guess, an exception in that there isn't a new prime minister yet. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, as you know, uh, Prime Minister Noda is still in office, but he has uh, indicated that he will no longer be there soon. Uh, but, of course, we're all waiting to see how he defines soon. Uh, seems to be a, a leader's of, uh, interest in defining words is soon and so forth. Uh, <laughs> Professor Curtis has known every uh, Japanese Prime Minister pretty well for the last 30 years except for one who only lasted a couple of months. Uh, and uh, indeed, he has an a extensive uh, network of, of friends and contacts with the leaders from, from all over the, pic, uh, the political spectrum, uh, the Democratic Party, the Liberal Democratic Party, Komeito, and so on. And this network is, uh, I think, something that is very valuable for all of us because it gives him an intimate sense of what's going on in Japan. Uh, he has the advantage as, a, as an outsider because he's not Japanese, because he's an academic, and because he doesn't have any particular uh, axe to grind. Uh, at the same time, he's an insider because he's fluent in Japanese and because he's very trustworthy in not revealing information that are private conversations that he, that he shouldn't re uh, view. And uh, so uh, I think he's highly uh, trusted as well as regarded by Japanese politics, by politicians. The, the Japanese politics, as you know right now, are, are even more turbulent and difficult to understand, uh, much less predict. Uh, you know, who's going to be uh, the next uh, uh, head of the LDP? Uh, who will be the next, uh, when will the next lower house election be held? Who will be the next prime minister? 
What will be the prospects for uh, Toru Hashimoto and his new party, the Japan Reformation Party? Uh, I, it, for, for me, since I'm not a political scientist, this is all very complicated and messy. Uh, and, uh, and I suppose it is for Jerry, too. But we're looking forward to him to uh, helping us understand as, as best we all can these uncertainties and, and giving us a view as to what's going to happen. So, Jerry, we look forward to your perceptions, your insights, and your explanations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hugh. Hi, everybody. I'm really delighted to see so many people here uh, clearly having a reception with free drinks and cheese <laughs> <laughs> is the way to turn out, turn out the crowd. Also, having a class that has no choice <laughs> but to show up because I threatened we were going to take attendance and I would sc scold anybody who wasn't here. Uh, but I think also there's a lot of interest, um, as there should be, in what is going on uh, in Japan and especially in East Asia, in Japan's relations with its neighbors, with Korea and China, um, because with both there's a seri there are serious territorial and uh, historical disputes that don't calm down, if anything, get worse. Um, what I wanted to do today, and what I will do, at least for part of this um, of this lecture, uh, is is to actually not talk so much about what is going on right now as about why I've given you know I've given this lecture as, as you said I think this is the eighth the eighth time I think there's been seven prime ministers. There'll be probably another prime minister before the end of the year, although I'm not certain that Noda is finished. We'll come to that in a minute. But this is more than just coincidence. There's something going on here. There's a pattern. Rapid turnover of leaders, uh, ineffective leadership, um, uh, inability to really I, to, to specify what the goals are of the government, uh, a lot of intra-party conflict, and so on. Something deeper is happening here, and I want to get into, I want to think with you about what the problems are uh, that have created this political confusion. So um, I was serious when I made the title for this talk as being Making Sense of Japan's uh, uh, Political uh, fu uh, Confusion. I wrote a book a few years ago uh, called The Logic of Japanese Politics, and a number of people said, well, that's kind of an oxymoron. You know, there's no, there's no logic to Japanese politics. Well, there is logic to Japanese politics, and there is reasons for the confusion. In fact, there are ways to deal with the confusion. I want to come to that. Um, but first, uh, at least a, a little bit of kind of uh, uh, about the current uh, situation. It will become more confused, not less. That's the sad story. That's the 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 the, um, the reality that what whenever this election for the next for the lower house is held probably before the end of the year, um, uh, it's very unlikely, probably impossible for either the DPJ or the LDP to get a majority. Uh, so there's going to be one of them will come out the number one party, and they will form a coalition with who? Very uncertain. Maybe the LDP and the DPJ together will, will form sort of grand coalition. Maybe this group around the mayor of, uh, of Osaka, uh, Mr. Hashimoto, may win enough seats uh, to have kind of a casting, a casting vote. Um, I personally believe that this Hashimoto phenomenon is something, is to some degree media created. Um, I, I would be surprised if he is going to have a lasting major impact on Japanese politics, but it is true that people are disappointed, if any, maybe even disgusted with the established parties, and so there's an appeal to vote for some group that's new and fresh, and that would be this Hashimoto uh, 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 party, which is you know national party that he's in the process of forming. Just like in the past when you had 
um, Mr. Hosokawa and the uh, um, uh, uh, Nihon Shinto and um, lots of third parties arise. They get a little bit of, you know, they get attention and then they disappear. We don't know. Maybe Hashimoto will 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 become more more important. There'll be some sort of party realignment. When the election is going to be held, we don't know. Who the president of the LDP is going to be, uh, we don't we don't know. We know it's going to be one of probably th of three people, uh, Mr. Ishiba or Mr. Ishihara, who's the son of the governor of. Uh, of Tokyo, uh, or Mr. Abe, who was the prime minister before. It, it, this actually relates to a point I want to make later about the problem of Japanese leadership. What do Mr. Ishiba, Mr. Abe, and Mr. Ishihara have in common? Every one of them has a father who was in the diet. Uh, there are so many of these second generation uh, candidates, uh, second generation politicians. You know, some, Jack second, some, pol some kids grow up in a political family and they say, I really want, I love what my father does. I want to do the same thing. I want to be a politician. They have a passion for it. They become really good politicians. And there are some in the Japanese diet like that, uh, uh, of course, now. But a lot of others, you know, daddy gets sick or he dies. And mama says, okay, now you have to carry on the family tradition. And if that's why you become a politician, you're not going to have the passion for the job. If you don't have the passion for the job, whatever job you do, if you don't have a passion for your work, you're not going to be very good or enjoy it very much. There are too many politicians like that um, in Japan. Anyway, um, uh, if, you know, my guess is that Mr. Ishiba is probably going to become uh, the president of the, of the LDP. Uh, uh, and then the election will at some point occur they have to they have to agree on um, on a on 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 a bill to issue government bonds to for the to to fund the government uh and on changing making at least a a, a, a modest change in the electoral system distribution of seats in the lower house in order to uh, to respond to the supreme court's decision that this current distribution is unconstitutional that'll probably happen in in October or November and the deal will be the opposition will agree to do these things in return for the solution of the house so you know exactly when it'll happen i don't know but and we don't know who's which party is going to come out on top but what we do know is this it's going to be an unstable government it won't let probably will not last uh very long uh and what it's what its agenda will be is very uncertain what are the issues what that uh, this election is about. Not very many th that you can identify. It's not about the consumption tax because they all agreed on raising the consumption tax. It's not going to be about nuclear energy because every politician is running away from taking a firm position on, on the nuclear energy issue. They don't want to lose votes from the public that wants Japan to stop relying on nuclear energy and they don't want to lose financial support from the business community that insists that Japan continues to depend on nuclear energy. So you look at this DPJ policy, which they announced last week and kind of renounced this morning, um, <laughs> that they were going to move towards zero reliance on nuclear energy. First, it was supposed to be by 2030. Now it's by the 2030s, which ends in 2040. Um, but with so many, with so many qualifications, they won't build any new nuclear plants. But plants that they've already decided to build, even though they haven't started, they will build. Uh, but anyway, today they announced that this is kind of a hope rather than a policy goal. Anyway, they're talking through, that they're they they they're, they're talking double talk. Why? Because the business community. <clears throat> Keidanden, uh, Keizai Doyukai, and the Chamber of Commerce had a joint um, uh, uh, news conference, the leaders of those three organizations, to say how out outrageous it was, how terrible, you know, suicidal it was for Japan to get out of nuclear, putting tremendous pressure. The LDP is not touching the issue. These L the, they're trying to avoid having to deal with the issue. I think what has shocked the politicians and Mr. Noda in particular, 
is that they i don't they didn't expect that opposition to the use of nuclear energy would grow stronger the more the fukushima accident recedes into history it's stronger now than it was a month ago and stronger a month ago than it was 6 months ago uh and every friday there are these demonstrations uh around the diet uh opposing nuclear energy it's um you know uh you can make the argument that more people will die from uh, inhaling carbon monoxide uh from uh, you know reliance on fossil fuels than 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 will possibly be hurt by uh by a nuclear accident you know nobody was actually directly killed by the nuclear accident but the fact is that virtually in a, you know an entire prefecture it's become a ghost town uh the tohoku area has um uh suffered in, in incredible damage and for a country with with the kind of you know with the earthquake uh uh problems that japan has the idea of building lots of nuclear power plants on uh on you know at, at this at the sea coast just i think has scared japanese japanese public and so no that turned uh, uh turned around his view from from supporting the continuation of reliance on nuclear until such time as you know other substitutes could be found to taking a much firmer position in opposition because there's an election coming uh but under all this pressure he's backed off so anyway tax issue is not an issue nuclear issue is not an issue so a big issue in this election is senkaku and china relations um uh, and um the ldp candidates to be ldp president um are criticizing the government for not being hawkish enough on senkaku uh i think this is campaign rhetoric it's like mit romney saying um if he becomes president not only will he ignore the 47% of the americans who didn't vote for him um uh but he'll declare china a currency manipulator on day 1 well you know if he did that what the chinese are likely to do on day 2 is something he doesn't want to contemplate uh so it's a threat that he won't follow he wouldn't be able to follow through on and the same i think probably is true for the ldp saying that if they get power they will build port facilities or in, in other ways uh do things that violate the status quo what has been the unwritten sort of agreement on, between japan and and china on how to manage this senkaku uh, problem but uh so they probably try to back away from it but it, you know you're making commitments in a ca- in a campaign it's very dangerous So just a few words about I don't want to spend a lot of time about Senkaku now and if you have questions I'll be happy to answer them but just a few things about the Senkaku issue It didn't start this year it has a long history uh there've been incidents over the years uh one of the most serious happened in 2010 when a Chinese fishing ve- you know Chinese fishing vessels come into the waters around Senkaku all the time it's a very rich fishing area they catch fish then the the Japanese coast guard says enough get out you know leave they leave um that's the way the game's been played but in 2010 this chinese fishing vessel uh rammed uh a japanese coast guard uh ship and they arrested the uh the the captain uh they didn't just send them away they they arrested the captain and that created a big turmoil in relations between uh, china and japan and then you know about 10 10 days after they arrested him they let him they re- they let him go without indicting him and so on uh which was a way t- for you know to 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 try to calm the waters but the chinese didn't let it go you know then they demanded an apology and compensation and so it was a na- it left a, a, a nasty aftertaste in everybody's mouth but then things quieted down but what happened this year uh is that the government the japanese government let the governor of a prefecture run japanese foreign policy uh by 
by Ishihara, the governor of Tokyo, deciding that he was going to buy the islands. It's kind of a curious situation in the Senkaku Islands. There, there, there are five islands. Um, uh, uh, four of them are owned by a family. Man owns three of them, and sister owns the other. So Ishi Ishihara negotiated to buy the th three islands from man who who uh, who owns them and ra and raised uh, contributions, fourteen million dollars in contributions from people to to pay for these for these islands. Uh, and that, if that were to happen, and then you know, Ishihara, Ishihara is well known being uh, being very nationalistic, anti-Chinese, um, uh, wanting you know major rearmament of Japan. And so, for Ishihara, the idea that this would create a problem in Sino-Japanese relations, that was not something to be worried about. That was something to be hopeful for, because how else are you going to shake the Japanese out of their lethargy? about the need to rearm unless you have a real sense of threat from China. So I think, you know, Ishihara's objectives um, uh, raise tensions with China and put the Americans on the spot. Are you going to defend us or you're not? Um, it, it's been a very successful strategy on his part. And Noda's response was, we can't let this happen. You know, Noda is very ca cautious. He wants to not roil the waters around Senkaku or Takeshima for that matter and calm things down with both China and Korea and I give him a lot of credit for this cool-headed approach but his response was we can't let Tokyo buy these islands uh, and then go forward and do other th and do things on them that will really upset the status quo and make it a matter of face for the Chinese uh, to take a strong strong counteraction so his decision was to buy the islands, have the central government buy the islands, reassure the Chinese that the purpose of doing so was to maintain the status quo, not to upset it, not to allow any facilities to be built in the, in the islands. When I was in Japan in, um, before coming back in June, I guess it's sometime in May, one of the very senior people in the Noda administration who's name I won't, I won't mention, uh, and I were actually having dinner, and he said that, this is before the decision was made, you know, we'll buy the islands, and we'll, you know, the Chinese will understand that the purpose here is to keep things on an even keel. And it was wishful thinking, completely wishful thinking, uh, because buying the islands upsets the status quo, even though the goal is to, ma is to maintain it. There was an option, the option was not to let the Tokyo government buy the islands. The, 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 they cannot buy them without the approval of the central government. But to do that with an election coming, with the public, with, na with nationalism saying, it, they're ours, we can do whatever we want with them, why is this prime minister being so weak-kneed uh, and kowtowing to the Chinese? It would have cost him dearly in terms of domestic opinion. Uh, if he had simply stopped Ishihara, and you don't stop Ishi Ishihara easily, you know, he <coughs> would go try to visit the islands himself, you know, he, you know just keep on, so they've decided to buy the, to buy the islands. Uh, and, and the response in China, as you know, um, on the public level, have been demonstrations, which are okay, but riots, burning down of Japanese factories, um, uh, other uh, violent behavior that the government at first at least uh, was slow to try to control. You know, I think this Senkaku issue it, 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 uh, for, for the Chinese government, it's such a dangerous issue. You know, you see these people in these, dem the, in these demonstrations around the Japanese embassy in, in Beijing carrying uh, posters with, with, fo with pictures of Mao Zedong. What is that all about? I think it's a code for saying, one, once upon a time, we had a strong leader, and now you guys are not being really tough with our uh, you know, eternal enemy, Japan. That's the point of the, of the, of the, of the picture. In any case, uh, the Chinese government um, has had the problem of how 
to respond to this public outcry. It's not I, it's not manipulate. It's not being ma manufactured by the government. I think at the senior level, the Chinese government, like the Japanese government, want to calm this down. But you know, in a in a country that's not democratic, in many ways, public opinion is much more dangerous. When the it's very there's no escape valve. There's no safety valve. Uh, you don't have an election. You, it's easy for these issues to be turned against the government itself. So I think the Chinese government is fearful of its own of its own people on this issue. In any case, I don't want to go on with this right now. But I'll come back to it later if you like. This issue will calm. They'll find. They'll have to find a way to calm this down. But one final point on Senkak. It presents a huge problem for the U.S. and a very dangerous problem for the U.S.-Japan alliance. You know, Senkaku Islands were returned to Japan in 1972 with the reversion of Okinawa. They had been treated as part of, of the Duke Island chain uh, when, you know, after the war and were reverted to, uh, to Japan. But the U.S. has never taken the position that Japan has sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. The U.S. position is a complicated position uh, that the U.S. is obligated under the security treaty to uh, defend territories under the administration of Japan, which includes the Senkaku Islands. But it does not recognize Japanese sovereignty, which is an issue between Japan and China. Now, if the Chinese take provocative actions against Senkaku like they did in 2010 with that fishing boat incident, uh, the U.S. response is quite clear. Hillary Clinton said Senkaku is under, comes under Article 5 of the Security Treaty. We're on Japan's side. But what, what happens when the provocation comes from Japan? Are we going to go get involved in a military clash with China to defend Japanese interests over an issue in which the Jap Japanese created the problem, which is what Mr. Ishihara's actions did? So Liam Panetta, who's in Beijing, was in Tokyo yesterday and in Beijing today, is trying to convince both sides to calm down. But for the right wing in Japan, this is a test. Are you with us or are you not, or are you not with us? And um, uh, uh, for the, so the U.S. has to engage in some skillful diplomacy here uh, to assure the Japanese that this alliance is reliable and at the same time not get pushed, put into a position where we end up in effect defending Japanese sovereignty. So how do you deal with this issue? There's only one solution to territorial disputes that Japan has with Korea, with China, and with Russia, and that is not to resolve them, not to try not to deal with them, put them on a shelf. Deng Xiaoping had exactly the right answer. This is too much for our generation to deal with. Let future generations figure out how to handle this issue. That is the that that is the, um, the 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 thinking that needs to uh, re to, to dominate the leadership in both J Tokyo and Beijing, and I must say in Seoul as well. Uh, you have to put somehow shelve these issues because there's no solution to the sovereignty issue. Frankly, on Senkaku, I think Japan should do what it's done on Takeshima. Bring it to the International Court of Justice. But Japan doesn't want to because, un, you know, Takeshima, the, South, the Koreans control, so Japan wants to bring it to an international court in the hope that they can get it. But on Senkaku, Japan controls it, so they don't want to bring it to the, to the, to the court. If the Chinese were smart, that's what they would, that's what they would, they would uh, demand. Then if the Japanese said no, it's a big PR victory for China, but it's not likely to happen. But somehow this issue has to be, has to be shelved. The danger is that nationalism <coughs> will continue to grow in all these countries, and that will be a major problem for uh, for um, uh, for Japan. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me, having said that and spent too much time at it, go back to this bigger question: What? Why do you have this kind of political confusion in Japan? So one reason is that you have not very good leadership. The leaders have not been impressive. Uh, after Koizumi, there have been six forgettable prime ministers. Um, and of them, I think this current one is by far the best. Uh, but Noda, too, 
uh, you know, his popularity is somewhere around 26, 27 percent. Uh, here, that would be really, really low. In Japan, you know, he's kind of setting a record for having high popularity compared to <laughs> his immediate predecessors. Uh, and it has, and it's kind of stabilized. It hasn't gone down in 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 the last in the last few months. Um, but no does no, you know, he's. I think at least he. Once he stuck, once he took, he took a position. He stuck with it, and he figured out how to get it done. The tax, the consumption tax increase. You can argue about whether it was the right decision to take at this time, but politically, he pulled it off. Unlike his predecessor, Mr. Khan, you know, who called for an increase in the consumption tax, then ended up losing an election, backing off on it before, before then, losing all kinds of credibility. No, so you give. I have to. I give no to credit. I think on these foreign policy issues. Um, He's he's been very he's been trying his best to calm to calm uh, calm things down, but generally, there's a leadership problem in Japan. Why? What is the, what is the problem? Uh, one is that you have a party that came into power three years ago, the DPJ, totally inexperienced, almost nobody in it who had had any government in, any executive experience, you know, in a cabinet. Uh, so it was amateur hour. Uh, and the DPJ came in with the idea that, you know, the, this, 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 view, the, this view in Japan, among Japanese politicians that the U.S., this goes back a long way, this kind of, an, you know, this kind of idolizing the U.S. model. The U.S., in the eyes of Japanese politicians, is a country I've never visited. Uh, <clears throat> but for a lot of Japanese politicians, the way American politics runs is that Political leaders make all the decisions, and bureaucrats carry them out. Uh, and that you have these political appointees who come in, and they take over. And so the bureaucrats are kind of clerks that carry out the, the, the policies of the political leadership. But that's not the way the world works, and that's not the way the U.S. works. And that's not the way Hillary Clinton runs the State Department. She doesn't run the State Department by telling the bureaucrats, now you don't tell me what, you don't give me your advice, I'll tell you what to do. No, that would be a disaster. Uh, so this idea of seiji shudo, politicians in charge that the TPJ came in with, that's what they thought, they thought they were gonna be like what they think Americans are. That is, you treat the bureaucrats as clerks, you don't listen to their advice, you have a, several people who are, you know, vice ministers and parliamentary secretaries, along with the with the minister, sit in a room, close the door, keep the bureaucrats out, make up their mind about what the policy should be, hand over a paper to the bureaucrats. Now you do it. You think that's going to work anywhere, especially in a country that, for over a hundred years, has a tradition of, uh, of, of 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 heavy bureaucratic involvement in the policy making process? No, it was bound to fail. And it did fail. I think at the beginning, there were a lot of bureaucrats who were sympathetic to the goals of the DPJ and would work with it. But you don't, you can't be successful by destroying the morale of the professionals that have to carry out the policy. So they had that problem. The other side of that coin, by the way, is <clears throat> uh, a lot of Japanese uh, uh, senior bureaucrats were openly dismissive, critical and dismissive of the DPJ government and criticized it. If this were any other parliamentary system, they would be sacked the next morning. The fact that they could get away with it uh, is, is, does not reflect well on, um, on, um, on those bureaucrats' understanding of what democratic politics is all about. At the end of the day, you got to do what the elected government wants, whether you like it or not. There are a lot of bureaucrats in the United States who didn't like George Bush. There are probably some, you know, bureaucrats who don't like Obama and his policies. But you don't really, at the end of the end, you really don't have a choice but to, to, to support them. So there are problems on both sides. Anyway, sure, you know, change of party in power. Here, uh, uh, I guess already. Romney is being briefed by the CIA and Treasury and other agencies with classified and, and detailed information about all kinds of issues. Of course, this is part of our way of having a transition. In the event that there's a change of power, the new government doesn't come in 
comes in knowing a lot about about the key issues. But when Mr. Hatoyama became prime minister, he came in without having had access to any bureaucratic uh, files, without any briefing by government officials about key issues. Um, uh, so there are those problems. But this goes deeper than just the DPJ. If it was a DPJ problem, the problem should have started with the DPJ. But from 1990 to 2001, 11 years until before Koizumi became prime minister, there are nine prime ministers. From 2005 to today, after Koizumi quit, there are six prime ministers. It's not that this started with the DPJ. This started back around 1990. That is this rapid uh, turnover. In the early 90s, you had change of party and power. Opposition came to power. Mr. Hosokawa became prime minister. Then you have this crazy arrangement where the head of the Socialist Party becomes prime minister in an LDP-dominated government. This is not. This is an ancient. This isn't ancient history. This happened in the 1990s. Then you have this great, interesting, fun interlude. His name is Koizumi Junichiro. Five and a half years of uh, charismatic leadership and um, uh, you know captured the imagination of the public, but it didn't last. And when he left, things went back to what they had been before. So why? Well, one reason is that the quality of politicians clearly has declined. And part, of that, and part of the reason is the system of recruiting and training politicians that work so well in the post-war system has collapsed. It used to be in the good old days um, uh, that <clears throat> those people who became politicians came essentially from two different sources. They were either people who had spent a, their lives in local politics and became prefectural assemblymen and mayors and so on, and then came up into the diet. And there in Japanese called a term that is now a dead word, doesn't, does, is not used anymore in Japanese. It's called tojin, tojinha, the professional party man. Uh, and these professional party men interacted with another group that was the other major source of Japanese political leaders, and they were senior bureaucrats people like Mr. Ohira and Fukuda and others who reached high levels in the bureaucracy and then came into politics. So you have these street smart professional politicians and policy wise bureaucrats together in the LDP. They had their finger on the pulse of the public and they also know how to make, how to make policy and deal with, and deal with the bureaucracy. That's, the, that's what happened. And then so you're elected to the diet, you join a faction, senior people in the faction, it's kind of an apprentice system they teach you the ropes uh, about uh, you know, how, to, how, to, how to be effective in politics. Um, you go to the, you know, the party policy affairs committee every morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, that's where politicians, you find them, um, being briefed by the bureaucrats on, key is on issues that they're dealing with. They all join some you know, groups, agriculture or transportation, whatever group they, they join. So there was a system in place, but that system has collapsed and no new system has been created. So what do you have instead? A lot of second generation politicians. Um, uh, in the LDP, it's about half, maybe even more uh, of, of politicians who you know, are kind of from, from, from political families, parents, uh, you know, fathers who were, who, were, who were diet men. And then this group of this uh, Matsushita, Matsushita Seikijuku, uh, graduates that dominate the, they dominate the DPJ, Prime Minister Noda and Foreign Minister Gemba and many other of the L, of the uh, the DPJ. Can, you know, there are four people running to the president of the DPJ. Noda's going to win, but uh, two of them are second generation. Even in the DPJ, two of them are second generation. Uh, Mr. Kano and Mr. Akamatsu, his father was a famous socialist politician, uh, and two and two of them are graduates of this Matsushita um, uh, Juku. Um, but, you know, the Matsuda Seikijuku, Matsuda Konosuke was a very interesting man, but his notion of what was needed wa was not exactly what you think about when you think about modern politics. His idea was we need people who are physically and spiritually strong. So people who go to the Matsuda Seikijuku, they run long marathons, uh, they, they, they study much stuff philosophy, and then, you know, they're there like four years. It's a long, it's a long time. And then they study what they want to study. There's no set curriculum. Uh, 
I've suggested to them, uh, you know, at least get them out of the country, go to China for six months, come to an American university for six months, get some sense of the world. Anyway, the point here is that there's been no system created to replace a system that once was effective, but that no longer, uh, no longer, uh, no longer works. And, you know, if a Japanese like to look at American politics as a model to emulate, but something they've not figured out how to emulate or to create and create their own version of are American th are think tanks, not just American. You don't have to come to look at the U.S. Just look uh, next door at South Korea, in which so many think tanks, people in think tanks play such an important role in the policy making process. It's not totally dependent on the bureaucracy, but there is no, nothing comparable. In Germany, each of the political parties has a major think tank attached to the party, so on and so on. So you have a problem of, of, um, of, tr of, of, of the inadequate training of politicians. You know, politicians, they have to be able to think strategically. And secondly, they have to manage things. If you're not trained to do either of those, you're not going to be very effective. So what do we have? We have a lot of children in the diet. First, we had the Koizumi children, because Koizumi you know, uh, wanted to run people against people in his own party who had opposed them on postal reform. So he found a lot of women who were attractive, had no involvement in politics until then, and, other, and others, some men, and they were elect a lot of them were elected. They became the Koizumi children. Then when the DPJ was elected, Mr. Ozawa picked up another group of amateurs who had, nobody had ever heard of. And they were elected. And so we had the Ozawa children. And after the next election, there's going to be a group of Hashimoto children. So the children are running wild in the diet with very little in the way of adult supervision. This is a big problem uh, for, Japanese, for Japanese politics. The second, and this is an interesting point, I think, there's a kind of skill mismatch. You know, we talk about culture and political culture, but culture changes. Culture changes over time. And I've been around Japan long enough to have seen a lot of cultural change. Uh, and one of the things that has changed in Japan is people's expectations about leadership. What do they want in a leader? The first prime minister I ever met that I got to know in Japan uh, was Prime Minister Sato, Sato Esaku, who was Prime Minister, I think, from 64 until 72, longest serving Prime Minister in post-war Japan. Uh, I learned what charisma was by getting to know Prime Minister Sato. Charisma was everything that Prime Minister Sato was not. <laughs> Prime Minister Sato stayed in office for a long time. Uh, he had a nickname. It was called Jinji no Sato. Sato, the personnel manager. Because Sato was a genius at manipulating factional balances, of picking off people that might threaten him, um, of creating coalitions to keep himself in power and accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. And he was able to get stay in office all those years, even though he was not anybody's idea of a charismatic leader who communicated well with the public. There have been politicians since then, like him, who are really quite skillful. I think Mori Yoshiro, who was prime minister uh, 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 before, uh, before Koizumi, he's a good example. And if it had been the 1960s, he might have actually been successful. He knows how to play the factional game. But in the 1990s, in the, 2000, in the 21st century, no, this is unacceptable. This kind, of be, this kind of performance is not what the Japanese public wants. That's why Koizumi was so popular. He understood that the appeal, appealing to the public, persuading the public, and getting the public to put pressure on your own party and on the opposition, that's the way to rule. You know, there was a professor here at Columbia when I was when when I started studying here as a graduate student. He was still here. I think he left the year that I came. Named Richard Neustadt, and Richard Neustadt was was a specialist on American on the American presidency. He wrote a wonderful book which John Kennedy read 
and was impressed by and in, and made invited Neustadt to be an advisor and then Neustadt, Neustadt quit Columbia and went to Harvard. He founded the Kennedy School at Harvard. And, and, and Neustadt's definition of presidential power, I tell this to my Japanese politician friends all the time, his definition was very simple. Pow presidential power is the power to persuade. How it's persuasion. You have to persuade Congress. You use pork, you, use, you make all kinds of deals. You have to persuade the media. You have to persuade the public about what you're trying to accomplish. Now, some of the disappointment with, with Barack Obama is that we thought he had tremendous persuasive power when he came in. And now, we've, now I think a lot of people have been disappointed that he hasn't been more effective in persuading, in persuading the public to, to support his policies. But this is what the Japanese public wants. This is what they're not getting. This is what the system does not create. So this is a, this is a, a, a serious problem. Finally, on this, particular, on this point about political leadership, one reason you have rapid turnover of prime ministers is that you've always had rapid turnover of prime ministers. And what is worrisome about this issue, I don't have a lot of time to get into it today, but I'll, I'll, at least I'll, 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 make a, I'll, I'll note it, is that when Japan has had the most rapid turnover of prime ministers have been at a time when the world order has been most in flux. There's a direct relationship between political instability in Japan and, the nat and, 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 and world politics. Between 1926 and 1941, a very unhappy time in Japanese history, it's 15 years. How many prime ministers do you think were in Japan between 1926 and 1941? The answer is 15, one a year. Then after the war, you have a settling down. Yoshida stays in for quite a while. Sato is there for eight years. A couple of people were short, but that was because they got ill, Ishibashi and, and Ikeda. But it's pretty stable. Until 1989, I think the, the, the Japanese post-war world ends in 1989. That's when Mr. Takeshita resigns as prime minister. And that's when the only prime minister who I never met became prime minister. I was teaching at Columbia when Mr. Uno Sosuke became prime minister. No one expected him to be. There was no reason for him to become prime minister. He wasn't a leader of the party. By the time I got back to Tokyo, he was gone. <laughs> <clears throat> and ever since then, you've had this rapid turnover. Why? What happened in 1989? The Cold War ended. The bubble burst. The world order, as Japan has known it, had known it for the post-war years, became very fluid, and Japan lost its sense of what its national goals were. Because it was clear, the national goal was clear from the Meiji Restoration to, the to 1989. It was to catch up with the West. Actually, it was to catch up and overtake the West. And it's by the mid-80s, after they catch up and decide to go into overdrive to overtake, that the problems really, that the bubble arises and then and 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 then and then then you know and then uh, uh, a burst but Japan is still trying to figure out what do you do for an encore now that you've achieved this national goal of catching up with the west and they haven't come up with an answer uh, with an answer yet so you know I think at the heart the reason for the political confusion is one a leadership deficit because of the changes that undermined the, the, the system of training leaders. Uh, um, uh, and, and secondly, a tradition of having relatively weak chairman of the board type uh, prime ministers. Third, a change public, changing public expectations that the politicians cannot, have not been able to meet. Um, and then this problem of, of uh, of the challenge of, of, of this changing international system and having accomplished the, uh, the catch-up uh, catch goal. Now, how do you deal with this problem? One of the answers that's very popular with Japanese uh, commentators and Japanese politicians is, well, it's quite obvious how, what you do. You change the structure. So you have this problem of the lower house being having a majority in the hands of one party, the DPJ, the upper house, not being controlled by that party. So what's, what's the answer? Well, Mr. Hashimoto has the answer, Mr. Osaka's uh, mayor. 
eliminate the upper house. You got a problem because, you know, between the Senate being controlled by the Democrats and the, the House controlled by the Republicans? Answer is simple. Eliminate the Senate. No, this is not, I don't think this is going to solve Japan's problem. Um, it, by ha you know, although it was the, Amer the Americans wanted a unicameral legislator to begin with after the war, for those of you who don't know, it was the Japanese that insisted on having this upper house, uh, but they got it. I, that won't, I don't think that would solve Japan's problem of, of, having, of not having a consensus on what to do. That's the problem. Uh, there's a myth that if you change the structure, you change behavior. Yeah, you've changed behavior one way or another, but not, necess but not as you expect. And the, the fact of the matter is, I well, I've become extreme, increasingly skeptical about the structural reform argument as being the, the solution to uh, Japan's uh, uh, problems. You can have the same structure today that you had through the post-war period, and depending on who the leader is, it can be effective or not effective. You know, people talk about how weak the Kante is, the prime minister's office. But two prime ministers who I knew quite well, Prime Minister Uhira and, and Prime Minister Nakasone, they operated in this system. They both exercised real leadership. Each of them had a brain trust uh, when it came to international affairs. They had key intellectuals like Kosaka Masataka from Kyoto or Sato Seizaburo from Todai. And, and several others, they met with them all the time. You know, one of the interesting things about the old generation of politicians that I knew is how much interested they were in ideas and in spending time with people, with people who had ideas. Some argue that this was part of, you know, this, this is because they all came from that pre-war elite education, you know, elite track. They all had this, this searing experience of seeing militarism, experiencing the war, seeing Japan devastated, then recover. So they had a historic sense of history and a sense of the, of, of the national interest. And so they were always interested in ideas and philosophy. It was really interesting talking with, uh, with uh, uh, politicians. Today, the one politician, who is not a politician anymore, that I most enjoy uh, talking with, and I see him fairly regularly, is Nakasone. Because with Nakasone, you can talk about he wants to talk about big ideas and about the world and so on. Anyway, um, uh, uh, change, so, so changing, you, so you don't have to change the structure if you have strong leaders. On the other hand, you can change the structure, and depending on the leadership, it can either work or not. Prime Minister Hashimoto, not this governor, not the mayor, but the former Prime Minister Hashimoto Ryutaro, he, had, he, engaged, he brought about a lot of institutional reform. He's going to be recorded in history. I, I always find him a rather peculiar, uh, difficult person to interact, to, to, to deal with. Um, and I never appreciated him uh, 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 as much as I think now he deserved to be appreciated. This is, he was something of a, of, a, of a visionary. I think he really had a sense of what needed to be done to bring Japan into a, this kind of post-catch-up uh, uh, era. And I... And, um, uh, um, uh, in any case, so he, one of his reforms was to create the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy, the Keizai Zaisei Shimon Kaigi. And Mr. Mori became prime minister after, he, after that, and he instituted it, and it didn't do anything. And then Koizumi became prime minister. And he made this a central element in his um, uh, uh, fight to impose his priorities on the bureaucracy. And he appointed an outsider, Mr. Takenaka, uh, to run the council. Koizumi attended every meeting. I think he only missed one when he was uh, singing Elvis songs with, with George Bush. Uh, uh, and he gave Takenaka, you know, his, 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 he gave him political cover, and it worked. Nobody heard about the, Ke the Keizai Shimon Kaigi after Koizumi left, and then the DPJ eliminated. Well, you can recreate it, but if you don't have leadership, it's not going to make any difference. The one political reform that was very, that I think had a big impact, and almost entirely negative impact, was the electoral reform. So those of you who are in my class, you'll hear a lot about this, 
in, 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 in future lectures. I won't go into it today. But a single-member district system, which is essentially what this system is, is not a good system for a homogeneous country like Japan. It works in a country like the U.S., where each party sort of builds a different social coalition. And so you have a difference between the parties. But in Japan, where there are differences, but they tend to be shades of gray rather than black and white, when you have a single-member district system and end up with two parties, what are they going to look like? They're going to look like each other. And that's what's happened. And one of the interesting things, despite all this political confusion and, uh, and, and fighting between parties and this nejide jokyo and you know, the paralysis in the diet, what do we see on foreign policy? Convergence. The word is convergence. You cannot see any significant difference between the DPJ and the LDP on key foreign policy issues. Alliance with the United States, policy towards China, defense policy. Who did Mr. Noda appoint as his defense secretary? Someone who was a uniformed officer in the Air Self-Defense Force and then became an advisor to the LDP on defense issues and was Prime Minister Aso's right-hand man on defense issues, Mr. Morimoto. He's the defense minister in the DPJ, in the DPJ cabinet. Uh, so there's convergence on a lot of policy, consumption tax. Where's the argument against it? There is an argument against it. You didn't see it represented. This, this single member district system is creating havoc for difficulties for Japan because it's very difficult to create third parties in that kind of system. And yet th there's clearly a, a, a search for some alternative, some, party, some kind of party re, um, um, uh, you know, real, realignment. So, um, so structural reform, some of it is necessary, but I don't think... Uh, that that it's the answer to Japan's problems. There may not be any real answer. I mean, the answer is to come up with a new with new ideas about about um, what the goals and strategies should be, and that is a very difficult thing to do. And so, let me conclude with something that's been I've been thinking about and writing about uh, recently, and it relates to the China uh, relationship. You know, I said that uh, you see a lot of turnover in Japanese politics. It's been times of turbulence in the international community. In Japan, when, you know, the way Japanese think about foreign policy is very different from the way Americans or Chinese think about foreign policy. And it's reflected in, the, in language. Um, when Americans think about foreign policy, we think about how do you create a world order that, serve, that serves our interests, that protects our, our you know, the security and the prosperity of our people? And we take it as a commonplace, as common sense, the, that that is the objective, you, to create a world order that serves our interests. Japanese have never tried to create, have never conceptualized, I don't believe, since Meiji, the goal of the purpose of the goal of foreign policy being to create a world order. No, in Japanese it is, how do you survive and prosper in a world order defined by others more powerful than yourself? I'm often, often asked to give speeches in Japanese, and even to the present day, sometimes the, the subject, the title is suggested. Nihon wa dou iki no koreru ka? How can Japan survive in Asia? How can Japan survive in the world? So I did a Google search the other day. In Japanese, you do it. Long lists of all these kinds of, of articles about can you survive in Asia? Can you survive with a rising China? Can you survive in the world? So forth and so on. That's what it's been since Meiji. What was the restoration all about? How does Japan survive a world dominated by Western imperialism? Become a strong, have a you know, rich, rich nation, strong, strong army? It's all about survival. You do a Google search in English about can the US survive? It's kind of interesting. Not one article about foreign policy. Because we, we don't think about surviving in the world. We think about how the, the, the world has to think about how to survive us. 
So all the articles about survival on the, in English about the U.S. are, can we survive Obamacare? Uh, can the U.S. survive uh, Wall Street's uh, cheating ways? That, and so on. Well, very domestic. Not about, not about foreign policy. So when has Japan's foreign policy been most effective? 1870 to the outbreak of World War I. The trends of the world of the time were very clear. You know, in Japanese there's an expression, jiryu ni noru, riding the trends of the time, or, or um, uh, 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 what's another one, jidai no chōryu, the trends of the, of the age. And so, so Japanese think about how do you survive? And uh, you know what, in a lot of weak countries, small countries, this is what they do. Japan is not a small country. It's not a weak country. When it could be a great power, say in the 1980s, it was always, it still conceived of things in those, in, in, in those terms. So this is, so from, 18, from 1870 to the outbreak of World War I, then after World War II, Japanese policy is very, is very effective. They knew what the trends of the time were. They were strategic in their response. Uh, they did very well. When has Japan really been in trouble? The 1920s, the 1930s, and today. And these are times when the trends are very murky. The trends of the, of the times are very murky. Uh, in the 1920s, they tried to, 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 to go along with this American, the so-called Washington system of you know, re replacing balance of power politics with Wilsonian morality as the basis for peace. It didn't work. Uh, in the 1930s, they tried something very catastrophic uh, as, as the alternative. So part of the problem Japan faces right now is how they read the trends of the time. If they misread them, or if they read them as saying, you cannot depend on the US, uh, China's a threat, there'll be a response. Sooner or later, there'll be uh, a response. My own view is that that is not likely, that the alliance is strong, uh, that the Chinese and that rationality will prevail in Beijing and Tokyo and Washington as well, and these problems will somehow be 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 contained. But a policy of drift, of uh, not coming to grips with a lot of big issues, I think that's what we're going to see for some time to come. But things do get done, policies do get made. Uh, it's easy. It was easier to be very critical of the dysfunctionalism of Japanese uh, policy uh, years ago than it, much easier some years ago than it is today, because more dysfunctional than where? More dysfunctional than Greece? More dysfunctional than Washington? I don't know. It's a good, it, it, you could have a good argument about which country has been less has been more unsuccessful in dealing with the problems it faces. We, Americans, or the Japanese. So there's something going on here that doesn't deal, that isn't just about Japan. It's about how modern democracies operate in tough times. It's easy when the pie is expanding and the question is who gets more of the more, uh, of, of what, you know, uh, who gets what of the more that's available than it is in these very difficult times when the question is, how do you cut back? Um, no one has a good answer. Japanese don't have a good answer, but we're all becoming a little bit too much like Japan. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an, an unsatisfying note to conclude uh, a, a talk that's been too long anyway, but it, kind of an unsatisfying note to, con to conclude with, not, you know, I don't really have an upbeat message I don't really have a downbeat message. I don't think much is going to change. I think we'll, re we'll be back here next year. There'll be a new prime minister, probably a different group in power. I can dust off these notes, uh, change a couple of names. <laughs> Hugh will give exactly the same introduction <laughs> he's given for the past six years, and hopefully, Nonetheless, I'll be able to keep you interested in what I have to say. Thank you.
Do you have to six thirty? Yeah. Yeah. Which is six thirty. Yeah. We we have twenty minutes. Uh, Jerry said he would um, uh, respond to questions directly. I I'm just sitting here as a spectator, uh, as a as a enjoying this as as you're you're running the show. So keep on running. So, questions. And just briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt Gillum. Uh, I was wondering, you talk about structural reform. You had addressed the issue that we discussed before about there's not, there aren't think tanks, there aren't, there isn't a policy mechanism to brief politicians or to, to really bring the, the bureaucracy and the politicians into a working relationship anymore. Uh, but when you also talk about your skepticism about structural reform, does it include some kind of measure to, to make you know, the, the give the politicians a new source of, of policy expertise and give them something closer yeah. to the American system? No, I think there are reforms that are necessary. I was really criticizing the, the kind of conventional attitudes that dominate, you know, eliminate the upper house, directly elect the prime minister. That's another popular issue. It won't, doesn't, not going to work. It's not going to be in, in a, you know, in, in a parliamentary system in, in like Japan. It's, you have to be able to work with the diet. So you get a guy like Hashimoto, maybe he, he could be elected as, as prime minister, and the, he turns around, there's nobody behind him um, because people elected to the diet. No, but I think there are, there's a need for innovation. There's a need for creating um, sources of policy expertise. If you're not going to, uh, leave things in the hands of the bureaucrats. You have to find other ways to do it. You need these these kinds of institutions. So no, there's there's a need for structural. I don't mean there's not a need for structural reform, but the idea that if you if you if you have political appointees, you're going to overcome you're going to overcome problems, and it'll be better than relying on the bureaucrats. That doesn't make any sense. So there's a lot in um, in I think I think there's a lack of um, innovative thinking um, on the part of people who are advocating. Uh, a lot of lot of the reforms that are being advocated. Barbara, you had a question? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, Wait for the mic. Sorry. What do I do? You hold it? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, the only downbeat Special that service. I heard was uh, about Hashimoto-san. And uh, as a person who's been in the Kansai for most of my decades, he was such, uh, for the past three years or more, five, four or five years, he was such a um, breath of fresh air and uh, s had so many actualizations of the things that he was envisioning that your really, really negative remarks about him comparing him to the uh, Hosokawa dismissibility was kind of a shock to me. Okay. And uh, I probably uh, appreciate uh, a more balanced view than Barbara sure. Roosh being a big fan of Hashimoto. But I, 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 his, my picture of what he's been doing uh, and not gathering children, but on the other hand, having these major politicians from Tokyo going down there to talk to him and everything. Um, just would you say a little bit more about that so I don't sure. go home thinking that Jerry Curtis is bashing Hashimoto? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll go home thinking that that Barbara Roosh has really become a Kansai Jin. <laughs> because he's very popular in Kansai. It's not so popular elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, I'm not, you know, his coattails, I s doubt that they'll extend very far from, from Kansai. He'll do very, his group. Yeah, everybody, they'll do elsewhere from Tokyo. When you say Kansai, but not elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, well, so, but I mean, why am I negative? Um, uh, I don't say I'm negative about, about Hashimoto. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, whether this, how much there is there. I think the more people become aware of his views, you know, the Japanese public is essentially very risk averse, conservative, uh, worried about rabble, rabble rousers who are going to really shake things up in Japan's relations with other countries, who touch too closely on taboo issues, like forcing people to stand up and uh, and and sing the national anthem, um, you know, which 
in Japan ha has a particular resonance with 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 uh, problems of 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 history. Uh, Hashimoto is uh, is very hawkish. Uh, uh, he's kind of the natural ally for Abe Shinzo in the LDP. Um, uh, uh, and it takes more to be an effective leader than to be uh, a media star, than to be someone who can speak effectively. But I want to get an argument with Barbara Roosh about Hashimoto. You know, I'm I'm neutral in the sense that if he can be really successful and 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 create a new party that is popular and that the Japanese public likes, more power more power to him. I guess I've been around so long. I've seen these. Um, these third-party figures uh, rise up and disappear. I don't sense there's, that there's a strong organizational backing for him. That he has, you know, he's going to run candidates. He says he's going to run 300, 350 candidates and run candidates in almost every district. Well, who are these people? They're people they never, no one has ever heard of. But he's going, they're going to run on Hashimoto's ticket. So the idea is people will vote for Hashimoto. I don't know. In Kansai, they will. Outside of Kansai, I think even you know that that there's a lot of competition out there, uh, and I doubt that he's going to do very well. He may do well enough to have a casting vote, as I said, but not all that well. The party that's likely to do to do well, you know, lots of lots has changed in Japanese politics, but some some things have not changed that much. One is that defeated candidates of major parties tend to do very well the next time around. A lot of LDP. The best of the L of, of some of the best LDP candidates were defeated in the last election. What have they done for the past three years? They have spent every day, seven days a week, working their constituency. The LDP can be unpopular, but the individual can get can get reelected in the you know in a Japanese system where these individual linkages are so personal networks are so important. So I suspect the LDP will do will do quite well. Uh, I, you know, maybe, maybe Barbara, you're, you, you know, you've seen him up close, and uh, you, your view is, uh, you may be right, and maybe he is the answer to Japan's problems. But, but if so, we'll talk about it next year. But it'll surprise me. <laughs> Rich. Thank you, um, Rick Katz. Uh, if you do polls of the Japanese people. Uh, it's a very interesting change, it seems to me, but it leaves me in confusion, which I'm assuming you're going to be able to clear up. Um, to you? Thank <laughs> you. Now, it used to be people would vote for really their local uh, member, and even a guy who moved to a different party still vote for him. In the last two elections, people were more voting for the National Party, it was very volatile. All moved to safe seats, people won by 20 figures, lost. And people were saying they're voting what they expected about performance. So it seemed as if politicians would have to perform in order to do well. But in the rough and tumble of the diet, and, and in the US as well, it seems that what politicians are really focusing on is making sure that the incumbent is unable to perform, right? Ra making right. him fail, right. rather than actually offering <clears throat> their own ability to perform. So there's a, and, and so the, in Japan in particular, after Fukushima, the trust level is really, really just plunge, but here too, I really don't know about Europe, so I don't know to what extent this is sort of a universal problem of, of rich democracies. But there's a bit of a disjuncture between the, the population wanting people who can perform and, and the politicians not competing on who can perform best, but rather who, who can make the other guy unable to conform. I'm confused about that and I'm expecting well, you to not, clear up that confusion. Yeah, there's no contradiction really because um, uh, if people are voting on the basis of who they think can perform and the opposition could demonstrate that they really can't perform, then the next election they'll vote for somebody else. So it's in the opposition's interest to make it impossible for the, for the leadership, for the, for the party in power to perform. That's what the Republicans are all about with Obama. It's to prevent him from performing. Uh, and it's what the LDP has been all about with the DPJ. You, 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 you just throw lots of obstacles up in the way of the party performing. And the problem, that, I mean, the challenge to the, to the incumbent leadership 
is to convince the public, to get the public on their side. You know, that's what they try to do to Koizumi, too. And Koizumi, you know, since went over the head of his own party and uh, to the public and said, they're trying to do me in. If you agree, fine. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't enjoy this job. He was told, he was told he said, I'm not doing this because it's fun. There's no fun being prime minister of Japan. I'd much rather go listen to, you know, go, go see an opera and, and go out and have a good time. I do it because I think that something I, I want to get done. If the public decides they don't want me to do it, terrific. Let somebody else, I'm not keeping this seat and doing this to keep the seat warm. That attitude is so critical. You have to be prepared to lose. You have to be prepared to risk losing in order to be, in a, to be effective as a political leader. And, you know, uh, but, but I think that's what's going on. The opposition wants to make it impossible for the government in power to, 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 um, to succeed. And in a sense, the nation be damned. Uh, they'll take care of the problem after they get in power. We see that too, all too much in, in all our countries, especially both, in, you know, there's something very common between the U.S. And, and Japan in that respect. The other part of it, though, it's the, you know, it's the value change that I mentioned earlier. Uh, people want, they, they care who the leader is in a way that wasn't true in the 70s and, 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 and 80s and earlier. Uh, and the electoral system also Push, puts a lot more, since you only have one candidate from each party in each district, um, that candidate is kind of, has to represent the views of the leadership. Uh, and so people are voting more for the prime minister, for the president of the party when they're voting their local, for their local, in their local election. Not entirely. I mean, you know, local pork barrel politics and local constituency uh, relationships remain very, very strong. Clientelism remains very strong, but not as it was in the past. I think those, all those factors uh, go into it. But what it suggests, uh, by the way, the, in, another point is that the media, especially since 1990, has really gotten um, uh, sort of into a mode of, we got a new prime minister, how soon can we bring him down? Uh, and so they, they give, you know, they don't give him any slack. It's almost an immediate um, uh, critical view of the prime, of, 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 of the, the, the prime, of the prime, of the prime minister. Um, so media, and, and you know, we run public opinion polls all the time. If you're interested in America, you know, in politics, you can find all, you know, public opinion polls are coming out every day now about the presidential election, and you can go on the net and find them. But you don't find them on the front page of the Washington Post and the New York, and the New York Times, and a constant, you know, headline, the headline story is, today Obama's, you know, popularity went down from 49 to 47. Or, or 48. No, but in Japan, public, you know, this 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 obsession with uh, with public opinion polls and making and putting them on the front page of the paper um, and making it seem as though that is what you know that drives politics is very destructive. And I think the media's coverage of uh, of politics uh, uh, in Japan has just, a, there's a lot of, there's just very serious problems with the media's failure to just provide just the facts, folks, and let the folks decide what to make of them. There's um, so much in the way of, um, uh, you know, gossip, rumors. It used in the, in the old days, you know, when factions were very powerful, these, you know, the political journalists would go in the evening to the politician's house, called Yomawari in Japanese, and they'd sit around and they'd get all the, the inside scoop and then they would write anonymously the next day who's doing what to whom, and it had some meaning when you had people like Prime Minister Sato and, and, that, and that kind running politics as a factional game. Who cares uh, about most of the stuff that shows up on the political page of the Japanese, of the Japanese um, uh, newspapers? Not the average person, because they don't mean any. It doesn't really mean very much anymore. So little, so much about politicking, and so little about policy. This is a big problem with the Japanese media's coverage um, of of politics. You know, it's the, it's the, in Japanese, there's you know we have seiji politics, but there's a word seikyoku. Now you know the Japanese political writers are basically seikyoku writers. They write about the goings on 
inside Nagatacho rather than about the politics of the country and the policy issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, so I can go on, you know, I can get started, I, don't, I won't stop about the Japanese media, but there's some great journalists, but the media problem is very, very severe in, in, in Japan. Okay? I just wanted to ask uh, Keishimizu on um, political science a quick question. Uh, you've talked a lot today about the leadership and sort of the top-down politics in Japan. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you see bottom-up. That is, who mo mobilizes voters today in Japan if you see any change in those sort of brokers of votes from, like, let's say, the Koenkai of, you know, 30, 40 years ago, um, and, and if there is also any difference between who actually mobilizes votes and how diet politicians view who mobilizes votes. Is there sort of a gap between those two? Uh, so, probably the, 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 the share of mobilized votes through social networking, koenkai and so on, has declined, but it's still very critical. You don't, you might get elected, you might get elected once as a child, you know, as one of the, of one of Ozawa's children or Koizumi's children, but you'll see all of Ozawa's children, virtually all of Ozawa's children uh, are going to be defeated in the next, in the next election. A lot of Koizumi children, the same thing happened. You don't survive in politics without an organization that can mobilize support of the constituents. Uh, so in that sense, there's a lot of continuity with the earlier system. Uh, there are a lot of people who are no longer mobilizable because they really can't be reached through these social networks. It's like when you go to you go to Tokyo or Osaka or some city during an election campaign. You know they drive around in sound trucks, and uh, uh, you know, Noda Yoshihiko de gozaimasu, Yoroshiko onagaishimasu. This kind of nonsensical. I'm Mr. Noda. Please, you know, I, I need your vote, kind of thing. And they go around and they do this. But what always strikes me is so it, it's so peculiar. The system doesn't change. You know, it doesn't. Ch the campaign doesn't change. So particularly if there's an election in the winter time on a cold day and the sound truck is up against some tall uh, mansion and everybody has their windows closed and they have the sound, you know, the, the speaker up at, f you know, full volume and they're screaming so-and-so, you know, they go zaimasu yuroshiku and nobody is listening to them. So you're not mobilizing that housewife who's... Uh, sitting inside her apartment watching some uh, Korean melodrama uh, <laughs> on, on TV. Um, uh, so there's a lot of non-mobilized non votes, and they're the ones that end up vote if they vote at all, the you know, voting rate has gone down. So if they vote, they're likely to vote for the prime minister. You probably find, I haven't, done a, I haven't seen any polls, but you could, I, I would be pre pretty certain that you would find that a larger percentage of people who vote today don't know the name of their representative than was true 20 years ago. You have a lot of that in the States, you know, people vote Democratic or they vote Republican. They don't know who, the, who they vote, you ask them two months later, who'd you vote for? They don't remember the name of the congressman. That's how, starting to happen in Japan as well. So, so how do you mobilize votes? Because it depends on the party. Um, uh, uh, but one way you do it, and this is, old, this is both old, but it continues to be important, is you rely on, uh, on interest groups to reach them. So why does the DPJ and the LDP, both the majority of the, vo of the, of the indictment in those parties, oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade negotiation? Quite simple. They don't want to lose the vote of farmers. Uh, that would, uh, you know, would, that would result if they if they supported it. Uh, so I guess that, that that's not a complete answer, but um, but I think that so it's a mixed bag. It's less mobilized votes, um, but it remains still a very critical element. Uh, you do favors for constituents, you get 
rewarded. You don't. Uh, you may succeed if your party, you know, if the other party is unpopular and you might you might get in, but you're not going to stay around for very long. That's really true in every democratic country. You know, the idea that politics is about choosing a party and national policies. Yeah, there's that element. And that's what this, you know, this electoral form was supposed to bring about. But one of the important roles of politicians is to service their constituents. That's an, a necessary, important role of politicians in democracies. If you don't do that, it becomes like a bureaucratic system. Uh, it's you know the, 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 they know what people know what's best for for you. No, politicians should be responsive to their to their constituents, and I think that's a healthy part of Japanese politics. People criticize you know this clientelism and social networking and pork barreling and so on. I don't agree. I think that is a very essential role for for uh, politicians to provide the services and the goods that voters want. Anyway, Gary, are we out of time? Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We invite you to go back to the other area there.